Hello there. Uh, I'm going to be talking here about Max Weber, um, considered one of the three uh, essential founding figures of sociological theory, along with um, Karl Marx and Emil Durkheim. So we're going to be kind of doing a more kind of general overview um, of Weber's ideas and uh, a little bit about his, his background uh, and, um, you know, going into some of the writings, but without necessarily going super in depth. Uh, so this is more just oriented towards being a kind of an overview of his life work and his, you know, major themes in his sociological theory. Uh, Weber's ideas cover really wide range, uh, have a, a very wide scope. Um, he started off as you know, a, uh, a scholar of the law, a, a legal scholar, um, and but you know almost kind of immediately branched out into a number of different areas, uh, from politics to economics and um, especially religion. And he did this from a very young age. Uh, by all accounts, Max Weber was um, kind of a child prodigy in, in some sense, uh, who started writing these kinds of essays about history and religion and economics and the law when he was like 14 years old. Um, he was a very uh, physically ill ch child. He had a, a, a lot of um, health problems as a, as a kid and um, to some extent was kind of socially isolated uh, as a result of that. And um, I think that that goes to explaining to some degree how from a young age, he, he really threw himself into uh, everything he could, you know, uh, get his hands on as far as like um, reading uh, history and, and uh, philosophy and religion and the law and everything that, um, you know, kind of like everything under the sun. Uh, he was um, appointed, as it says here, a professor of economics in 1896, um, but shortly after that had a debilitating mental um, crisis, mental health uh, sort of breakdown that incapacitated him for uh, quite a while. Um, I think about, you know, two years or so. Um, in which he wasn't able to really do any intellectual work uh, at the end of the 1890s and was not able to really like become a uh, or, or hold, continue to hold his position in uh, academia as a professor. Um, he did continue, to, he, he did, um, was still involved in, in politics uh, for much of his life. And in fact, uh, after World War I helped found the, the German Social Democratic Party. Um, Weber's politics can probably be described as, a, as sort of like a mainstream liberal. Um, he was not a uh, Marxist uh, or um, aligned with the, the socialist movement that was growing very rapidly in Germany, you know, in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, he was certainly uh, aware of that movement and to some degree was influenced by Marx and the larger um, theoretical lineage of historical materialism. But he also took pains to kind of distance himself uh, from Marx and the German socialist left. Um, at the same time, he you know, was a kind of a, a, a German nationalist, but was um, critical of those kind of like uh, right-wing nationalism that would eventually, you know, kind of um, take root as, as, as Nazism, as, as fascism in, in Germany uh, after Weber had died. So he was somebody who kind of like tried to position himself, you know, sort of in between those kinds of political um, those dominant political waves of his of his time. The writings that we'll be looking at here 
um, particularly the, the Protestant ethic and the, and the spirit of uh, capitalism is like the most well-known of Weber's works, um, certainly within sociology. Um, it sort of helped to spark a larger kind of debate with Marxists um, over, you know, questions of materialism versus idealism, um, questions about like the influence uh, of like religion within economics. Um, we will see that Weber's an, uh, analysis in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism really privileges religion as a determinant or as a, as a causal factor in the rise of capitalism. Uh, towards the end of his life, he was sort of putting together a larger general economic history and uh, a history of capitalism, a, a theory of social and economic organization. Um, he also wrote many essays on questions of, of power, uh, questions of uh, bureaucracy uh, and social organization. Um, and uh, also a, a lot of essays about um, science and uh, sociology as a social science, uh, the methods that social scientists and sociologists should employ, um, and took undertook a very serious um, comparative study of different religions throughout history. So we will see that religion is something um, similarly with, with Durkheim that Weber thought was, you know, uh, uh, essential to sociological analysis. Well, you know, if you wanted to understand societies and their histories, um, there was just no avoiding the influence of religion. So his intellectual kind of themes um, and his, you know, original contributions to sociology can kind of be described in terms of his methodology and his uh, cultural orientation. Um, in terms of his methodology, Weber was very much uh, trying to understand the subjective motivations of individuals um, and especially like what causes them to take the actions that they do and how people attach meaning or find meaning in the actions that they, they take. Uh, this was very important for Weber. The individual was kind of his starting, the, the starting point of his analysis, the, his, his unit of analysis, as opposed to say uh, Comte or Durkheim or the other um, French founders of sociology that we've looked at, um, who kind of took society as their starting point and for Comte and Durkheim, society was more than just like the sum of the individuals who participated in it. Uh, society had its own dynamics, its own laws, um, and, and therefore was kind of their unit of analysis. Whereas for Weber, it always starts with the individual. Um, as far as his orientation towards culture, uh, for Weber, um, ideas and, and values that are expressed, you know, through religion, through politics, through art, and so forth. These are um, the important factors that motivate, that drive individual action, um, and that allow individuals to find meaning or attach meaning to the actions that they take. Uh, these are what Weber will call, you know, the subjective motivations of individuals. And so here again, there is this kind of this debate that is set up with uh, Karl Marx and, and with Marxism um, that, you know, as I mentioned, was becoming a dominant intellectual and political force during Weber's time. And so the, the, the debate or argument that Weber sets up is about what has more power to determine society and social change? You know, is it idealistic factors along the lines of religion and values and ideas, uh, matters of consciousness, 
that have the, the most determining power or as Marx and the Marxists uh, were emphasizing, is it material factors? You know, does it come back to issues of political economy as being the dominant social force that, um, you know, creates social change is kind of the, the engine of, um, of modernity and modern society. So Weber, as we will see, comes down on the side or emphasizes the side um, of idealism and uh, values, especially as they are embedded in religion. So um, his writings, you know, can kind of be seen in, in terms of like three major uh, themes. Um, one are these writings, um, particularly a group of essays on methodology, basically how to do social science, how should sociologists study uh, the social world. And um, so these questions of, um, as we'll look at here in a minute, his concept of the ideal type will be one of the more important and lasting contributions that Weber makes as far as a social scientific methodology. Um, he is also very concerned with the uh, onset of what he calls rationalization um, or the dominance of rationality or a certain kind of rationality that he calls instrumental rationality that grows up alongside the rise of modern society. And that is especially evident um, and pertinent to the study of religion and economics. And this we will find most fully expressed in the, in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Um, this co concept of rationalization, which Weber thinks is, you know, sort of taking over the whole world, the whole, you know, modern society um, over the course of history. And so he follows the way in which rationalization makes itself evident um, in bureaucracy, in power structures, uh, in forms of authority. Uh, in all of these cases, Weber sees the modern world as one that is increasingly dominated by this notion of rationalization. And rationalization, or you know, more specifically, what he will call instrumental rationality, is a is a mindset, is a way of thinking uh, uh, that is very oriented towards calculation, towards um, like cost benefit analysis, uh, a, a mindset that is oriented towards like the the most efficient means for accomplishing a particular objective or a particular goal. Weber will say that that kind of mindset um, and the values that go with it, you know, of, of efficiency and, um, you know, uh, calculation, that those will become, th those have become the dominant uh, intellectual forces that shape individual behavior um, and uh, that shape, you know, individual action. And then finally, he's, he's very concerned with the workings of power in political and legal systems. So here, his writings on class, status, and party, uh, on the types of domination and authority, uh, the different forms of, in which like power has um, presented itself, and also in which um, power has legitimated itself, like to make it say, it, itself seem legitimate um, so that people who are subjected to that power um, aren't simply coerced, but also willingly consent to following along with these forms of power and authority. So um, as far as the first set of um, concerns with sociological method, uh, in the writing Objectivity and Social Science, Weber is presenting what he calls um, an ideal type or a pure type that are meant to describe essential characteristics of a particular phenomenon. 
So this is like Weber's kind of main methodological contribution to sociology, um, really to this day, is the idea that what sociologists should do is kind of construct an ideal type um, that's defined by particular characteristics. And the key thing about this is that, you know, we, when we go out in, into the real world, we look into the real world, we don't necessarily see ideal types personified in a 100% kind of pure form. Um, as a method, the, the ideal type kind of abstracts from reality. Uh, it draws from reality, but then constructs uh, a concept or a type um, that is uh, more sort of like useful in the way that it allows us to understand things rather than something that necessarily corresponds to reality. So we almost never find the ideal type of anything in the real world. It's usually when we look out into the real social world, we find mixtures of different kinds of ideal types in which maybe one uh, type is more is dominant, but there are maybe like, you know, remnants, uh, vestiges of other types that are also um, included with that. And uh, so, you, as we'll see, you know, he has like ideal types of social action, ideal types of authority and legitimate domination, um, ideal types of uh, class, you know, and, and status. Um, all of these are meant to be kind of constructs that will allow the sociologist to understand the social world, um, even if the historical and social reality itself is, is kind of messier. Um, and so the ideal type will be this way in which Weber uses these concepts to try to construct, um, you know, the, the connections between individual social action and large scale institutions and ideas in society. So the essay um, on basic sociological terms uh, basically presents Weber's ideas for sociology, um, his, you know, his view of sociology as a scientific study of human action. And to give you a little context for this, you know, Weber um, kind of stepped into this ongoing debate that was going on within uh, German, you know, intellectual life at the end of the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century. And that, you know, sociology, as it was, you know, coming to be as a, as a discipline, um, was very much like caught up in this debate. So on the one side of this debate were the people that thought that sociology should basically kind of um, imitate uh, the natural sciences in terms of looking for causal explanations and developing general laws of human behavior um, in the same way that natural scientists were, you know, developing, uh, you know, the law of gravity or the law of evolution, uh, you know, that sociology should kind of like emulate biology or chemistry, physics, you know, the, the way the scientific methods for looking at the natural world should be applied to the social world. Um, on the other side of this debate, um, were those who stressed more of the subjective elements of social action and the way in which um, sociologists had to engage in a process of understanding and interpreting those forms of social action rather than developing uh, laws based on causal explanations the sociologist should be more oriented towards trying to understand uh, human motivations, why people do things the way they do, why people take the actions that they do. And so in that sense, you know, to um, engage more in the methods now that are evident in, uh, you know, eth ethnography, 
and in uh, a- anthropology and these kinds of disciplines that are more oriented towards um, understanding the way people use symbols and, and culture and uh, ideas to find meaning in the actions that they take. So implicit in this this other side of the debate is kind of the idea that like, you know, you can't really like use those like natural scientific methods that human beings and the social world doesn't work in the same way that like, you know, um, the uh, like biology or the natural world um, works in which you can develop these kinds of like laws of um, uh, evolution or laws of gravity that like hu- human beings and, and the social world uh, demand a different kind of uh, method and a different kind of explanation. So Weber kind of like tries to kind of like, you know, um, carve out like a third position within this that kind of incorporates elements um, like the best of from, you know, the two sides of this debate. So he basically believes that like, you know, social science should formulate causal arguments um, but causal arguments that have to do with human action, with, with social action um, that are based on interpretation and understanding. So this essay on basic sociological terms stresses the uh, understanding of subjective motives um, and then tries to, uh, as you see at the end of the essay, to construct these different ideal types of social action. So a more causal explanation that are based on these ideal types um, that would explain uh, why people act and uh, what motivations they have towards action at a, in a, in a particular circumstance. So these types of social action basically break down into four ideal types. And again, um, in reality, it's these these ideal types uh, are, you know, things are a lot messier. And so that, you know, in reality, a person's social action might combine, you know, two of these different kinds of um, motivations or types of social action, or one might be dominant, but then there you could find elements of another mixed in there. So it's it's better to think about you know these as kind of like a like a, a recipe or something where you know different elements are being um, mixed in with one another. So. In, in modern society, he says basically instrumental rationality or the instrumental rational social action becomes the dominant one, it becomes the dominant motive. And as I was saying with regard to you know, rationalization, this is a mindset that is very oriented towards like cost benefit calculation um, in which the person who is acting has these rationally pursued uh, objectives, you know, these goals um, and those goals and objectives to to some degree are kind of like taken for granted. And uh, the question just becomes of like, what's the most efficient way? What's the easiest, cheapest, less risky, less costly way of achieving that goal um, or that objective? And so it instrumental rational social action becomes is is a sort of a means end kind of orientation Um, and he says basically modern society increasingly demands that from individuals um, because we are thrown into this you know world of of capitalism and science and bureaucracy um, in which we are you know more and more put into these situations where we have to kind of like, you know, benefit, um, uh, calculate the costs and benefits of taking particular actions or not taking particular actions. Um, This is contrasted with, you know, a second type of social action that he calls value rational, 
in which we um, are more oriented towards like a kind of a deeper set of beliefs, whether they're um, ethical beliefs of right and wrong or religious beliefs uh, or, you know, aesthetic beliefs of, of beauty, um, you know, some set of uh, values that we pursue um, kind of regardless of whether they're going to succeed or not. So with instrumental rationality, it's all about like, you know, what's going to be the most successful approach. Um, with value rational approach, it's kind of like we're, we're standing up for what we believe in. We're standing up for our principles, you know, e even though like we might get, we might get, we might lose. Um, and to some extent that is, you know, from, from the perspective of instrumental rational uh, mindset, that is a that is an irrational thing to do, you know, to like to stand up for your beliefs, even though like you're going up against more powerful forces, um, you know, like, you know, that's that song like I fought the law and the law won, you know, like this kind of like the, the value rational belief um, is when we take these kinds of social actions independently of whether uh, of, the, of its prospects for success, um, independently of whether they, these are gonna uh, turn out well for us or not, whether we'll be successful. In fact, a lot of times I would say when we are acting out of a value rational, you know, kind of mindset, it's like, you know, we, we know we're probably gonna lose because we're going up against forces that are more powerful than us, but we have to like, you know, we have to say our piece. We have to act according to our conscience. We have to stand up for our values. Um, and from, you know, a more kind of like, you know, rational perspective, um, this is not always like the more rational thing to do. Um, similarly, like with effectual uh, forms of social action, those are the things that um, are kind of like where we are engaged in action that are based on, um, you know, more like emotions and uh, states of feeling. Um, and so here you can see Weber has kind of set up this dichotomy that's very common to sort of Western thought between, you know, rationalization on the one hand and, and emotions on the other, you know, that like to act emotion based on emotions is almost like inherently irrational. Um, with effectual types of social action, you can, you can think about how those might kind of overlap and dovetail and mix with value rational kinds of social action. You know, again, in which like, we're not necessarily taking like the most uh, efficient or, you know, uh, path towards getting what we want um we're kind of uh maybe not necessarily concerned with like you know the the success the prospects for success um here either uh with effectual we're not necessarily you know um acting in, in terms of like what's going to be successful or not we're kind of like acting in a way where we're you know kind of like reacting to our emotional state um, and then fourth kinds of social action are the, the ones that Weber says, you know, kind of used to be dominant or have been dominant for most of human history, but that perhaps are becoming less significant. Um, and this is uh, traditional types of social action. <clears throat> and these are determined by what he calls ingrained habituation, basically habit um, that has been ingrained in us. Um, usually passed down from generation to generation um, in which like we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily like thinking about what we're doing. We're not like engaged in like self-conscious action. We're not like trying to gain something or, you know, we're not like calculating so much as we're just kind of going along with like what's expected of us and like what we've done before and you know we're just kind of like in a routine and we're not necessarily like thinking about you know what we're doing and in fact Weber says a, a lot of social action like has to be 
traditional to some extent because um, to be really self-conscious about every action that we take would be really exhausting. Um, human beings would have a hard time functioning, you know, if we were always like thinking about everything that we did and, and like, you know, calculating or trying to find meaning in everything that we did. A lot of our social action, just by definition, has to be of this type of ingrained habituation um, because like that's what you know that's that that kind of makes social life uh, at least more um, e easier or more tolerable so um moving from his methodological essays to you know what is um certainly Daber's most significant work on um, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism to this day is one of the most widely cited and influential works in sociology, um, a work that is certainly also hotly debated um, and, uh, you know, I think has some rather obvious flaws to it. Um, especially if, if it's approached from a, a, a Marxist perspective or, or but also if, if it was approached from, you know, a kind of non-Western or, you know, anti-Eurocentric kind of perspective. Um, it's part of, uh, to, to contextualize this work, um, you have to understand that Weber engaged in, in really this lifelong study of the different religions of the world. Um, and to this day, his, his sociology of, of religion is, is quite amazing for, for the breadth of study in which he studied, um, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism and, and um, a lot, as well as, you know, the sects of, of Christianity and Protestantism and Calvinism and Lutheranism and, and all these things that we'll look at here in a minute. Um, Weber was really trying to compare all of these religious forms of thought in terms of the way that they structured um, or you know constituted the societies that they were part of. And, you know, again, he he believes that religious ideas, religious values, religious beliefs. Um, are not just like uh, determined, but are also determining in uh, societies uh, around the world. And so here in this work, his, his main question um, about the Protestant work ethic is how did this thing called the work ethic and this orientation towards profit you know, that we associate with, with capitalism, how did those become the dominant values in the West, uh, in Western Europe and, and later in, in the United States, um, but not in these larger civilizations of the East? Uh, and, and he's particularly, you know, concerned with comparing with, with, with China. So here you can, you can see kind of to like a little bit of like the, the, Eurocentrism or the kind of the, the Western bias that's kind of built into to Weber and also, you know, the way in which like to, to explain the rise of world capitalism, uh, you would also need to take into account, you know, colonialism and, and, and things, you know, that, that don't have necessarily to do with religion, um, but that he kind of shuns to the side uh, in this in this discussion, but uh, I do think that there are some there are some merits to what what Weber has to say here. Um, it basically is talking about like you know during the 16th and, and 17th centuries, you you have these different sects of uh, you know these different Protestant sects, these sects um, within Christianity that believe that came to believe that that economic success resulting from hard work was a sign of salvation. So 
many of these, like, you know, particularly the Calvinists believed in this idea of predestination. Um, predestination was the idea that like, whether you were gonna go to heaven or hell um, after you died was kind of predestined, you know, um, you know, there was nothing you could do to kind of like change your, uh, whether you were saved or not, or it wasn't like you could live like a good Christian life and therefore you would go on to heaven. It was like already written in stone, you know, whether you were going to go to heaven or hell, you know, before you were even born. And so you might think, you know, as I my first reaction would be like, if that's the case, then, you know, I'm just going to like live a life of like sin and gluttony and hedonism because like, who cares? Like, you know, if I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. If I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, but he says, that's not the way that these like Calvinists thought about it. The way they thought about it was like, oh, I'm going to look for a sign from God to see like, if I'm on like the chosen list you know, like if I'm, if, if I'm predestined um, for God's, uh, in, in terms of like God's favor, um, then I'll, then I'll get a sign, you know, like that whole sort of thing of like religion, like, you know, God, you know, give me a sign. Um, and for them, they came to believe that that sign was like, if they were successful in uh, business, if they were successful economically, but that was like a sign of their salvation that, you know, God had, they were on God's chosen team uh, that was going to, you know, be going to heaven. And so uh, it, it, it may be difficult to understand that kind of mentality, but Weber's point about this is, is that you have this, these, these groups of people who are oriented towards economic success because they believe uh, because it's part of their religious beliefs, you know, so they're, they're religiously motivated. The actions that they're taking are motivated by religion, but then expressed in economics. If they're working really, really hard um, because they want uh, a sign from God that they are, that they've been chosen and, and predestined for, for heaven. And so uh, hard work and, and economic activity become these virtues, you know, that people are supposed to engage in for the glory of God, um, not necessarily to get rich or for their own like self-interest um, or for their, you know, they're not necessarily, he's saying, motivated by material concerns so much as they're motivated by idealistic concerns um, uh, that, have to, that, that have their roots in religion. So one of the manifestations about this he, he talks about is the idea of a calling, you know, that like our occupation or our career, and, and you sometimes still hear people talk in these terms, um, that like one's career or occupation you know, isn't just like a way of making money, but a calling from God. Like, this is what I was put on earth to do is, you know, to do this job or to do that job. And so the whole idea of, um, you know, economic, you know, uh, the, the, like economic um, action was kind of underpinned by these religious beliefs, these moral beliefs, the idea that an individual's salvation was dependent on fulfilling the moral obligation to perform the duties of uh, his or her labor to the best of their abilities. So these Protestant sects, in other words, made um, hard work, self-discipline, time management, um, deferred gratification, all of these things became seen as virtuous, right? To work hard, but also, you know, to, you know, to work hard and, and to manage your time, but also like to not just um, instantly gratify yourself by spending your earnings, you know, um, but rather to, to save that money. Um, and so, 
uh, as much as they valued hard work and, and self-discipline and, and time management, um, they also said that, you know, basically like it wasn't, those things were not supposed to be motivated by like personal enjoyment or immediate gratification. Those were considered to be, um, to be a vice, you know, to be uh, verging on sin. And so hard work becomes virtuous uh, and then laziness and wasting time um, become sinful, you know, as it says in the, in the Bible, idle hands are the devil's plays things. And, but economic success is not supposed to be taken just for its own sake. It's not about, Weber says, at least initially, it's not about just like getting rich and then, you know, spending all of your, uh, all of your riches on, you know, luxury goods or, you know, on a, a life of, of gluttony and hedonism. Um, so it wasn't supposed to be about, you know, laboring for that sort of purpose. It was for the sake of God, for the glory of God. And, and so here is where a really fundamental thing comes about capitalism. And to some extent, this is kind of like where Weber and, and Marx do come together, um, that they both realize that the, the, the significant thing about capitalism is not simply like that it's oriented towards a greedy desire to get rich. Um, it's also that what happens is that the capitalist is supposed to reinvest the money that they've made into making more, um, you know, into, into buying more labor power and buying more means of production so that they can continue to make even more profit. Um, so this is kind of like what differentiates the capitalist mindset from, you know, other people in throughout history who, you know, pirates and so forth, merchants that have just kind of like, you know, they wanted to get rich, they were, but then they would kind of like turn around and spend um, all of their riches on, you know, uh, luxury goods, and they would only work as, as hard as they needed to in order to, you know, um, achieve or, you know, to, to make the, the money or the gold or, you know, whatever riches that they desired. Weber says what's different about these capitalists is they're, you know, yeah, they're, they're trying to make money and they're, they're working as hard as they can, but then they're taking that money and they're reinvesting it into making even more money as, you know, kind of capitalist entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's what creates this enormously innovative and dynamic system is you have all of these people who are working harder than they need to making money and then reinvesting that money into making even more money. And that's what's going to cause this kind of um, spiral of economic activity, this very dynamic um, uh, economic growth uh, associated with capitalism. You have people that are, that are working harder than they need to um, because they are motivated at least initially by these religious beliefs and uh, instead of just like, you know, blowing all their money during the over the weekend, um, they are like saving and reinvesting and, you know, living uh, like themselves, like living a frugal kind of lifestyle and uh, instead kind of putting their money into um, capital. To this day, like if, if you read, you know, money management advice books or, you know, like rich dad, poor dad, you know, th th these kinds of like these, these self-help kind of like economic books, this is the kind of advice that they will give you. Like, you know, take your money and then like invest it instead of like spending it. Um, that is ultimately the, the most like kind of rational form of behavior under capitalism if your objective is simply to make more money.
So Faber says like this, what's unique about this, this attitude um, is that, you know, traditionally other societies uh, and other religions had, you know, looked at work and, and economic activity as, as kind of like a means to an end. Like, in other words, you only worked as hard as you needed to, to get what you needed to survive, you know, what you needed to live. And then like you called it a day and you had a, you know, just took a siesta in the middle of the day. And, you know, most people were not, um, didn't work harder than they needed to, you know, they only worked as hard as, as they needed to for their survival. Whereas the Protestants, he said, had this kind of like religious compulsion to just keep going and like to, you know, to not relax because re relaxing was a sin um, and to not spend their money because spending their money was their, was a sin. So they're super motivated to work harder than they need to. And all the surplus that is being generated from that work is then being reinvested um, into expanding and growing their enterprises. Um, and along with that comes a sort of a rationalization of business transactions. So, you know, like in other cultures and more, Gaper calls them more traditional cultures, um, the business transactions, you know, might be more kind of like based on personal ties and, and less standardized. Um, and, you know, Weber says like with the onset of rationalization and this Protestant work ethic, business becomes much more kind of like cold and, and calculated and, and rational um, and less, less personal. He continually kind of draws on this contrast between, you know, the West and, and China, you know, in arguing that, you know, long before the West did, uh, China also had, you know, wealth and technology and uh, resources and population and, and had its own, you know, kind of trading companies and, and forms of, of mercantilism. But um, he says, you know, capitalism didn't develop there in the same way that it did in, you know, England and, and uh, uh, continental Europe and, and North America, because the institutions and the cultural and religious values, and he singles out Confucianism as far as the religious values, were impediments, they were barriers, obstacles, um, limits to the development of, of modernization and capital. Capitalism, uh, in the same way that we saw in the West. Um, so Weber says like, okay, well, this, this is the, sort of the model for understanding like the origins of capitalism. But then once capitalism is kind of um, set in motion, once the accumulation of capital, you know, is starting to sort of spiral, um, then uh, it, this, you know, capitalism kind of loses its religious, uh, origins, um, it loses these, um, this original religious, like, justification, right? So this sort of changes, um, the values of hard work and rational calculation and time management and self-discipline, these values can, are still, very virtuous, like I said, you know, go to any, you know, business management section of the local bus bookstore or, you know, any business school, and these things continue to be preached as uh, virtues of rational behavior under capitalism. But the thing is, is that they've lost their original connection to religion, that they've become sort of secular values Right. They've become things that have like been divorced from, you know, their original religious ideas, but they are still upheld as virtues or ideals that people should aspire to um, as the secular values under capitalism. What happens is that, you know, under modern capitalism, um, there's no longer that 
religious compulsion to reinvest because the forces of competition uh, make it so that, you know, especially for capitalists, for, you know, people who are owners of capital, um, they have to uh, reinvest their earnings or at least part of their earnings. I mean, you know, sure, Jeff Bezos can buy a yacht uh, and, you know, or like, the, you know, the, there's always going to be some sort of luxury good consumption. But the thing that makes them capitalists is that they're reinvesting at least part of that profit, you know, that surplus. Uh, those earnings are being reinvested back into the firm, into um, technological innovation and technological expansion. But the reason that people are doing that is not doesn't have anything to do with God anymore. It's because they have to compete with the other firms, the other industries that, you know, the, the other um, companies that are within their, within their industry, you know, within competition. Um, and and here is, is again, where Marx and, and Weber um, would sort of agree. Uh, they, uh, Marx calls it the coercive laws of competition. You know, the capitalists always have to invest in new technologies, in new forms of organizing the workplace. They have to invest in um, increasing their productivity because they've always got some competitor that's you know, nipping at their heels, trying to take away part of their market share, you know, trying to hone in on uh, their business. And so if you don't reinvest, if you don't keep up, if you don't innovate, you will perish. You will eventually lose out to the competition. Um, every capitalist knows that, you know, now. Um, so modern rational capitalism sort of becomes severed from its religious origins or its religious roots. And so the story that, that Weber is, is telling here is, is one that's quite uh, ironic. Um, this system that, you know, originally was motivated, was fueled by kind of spiritual beliefs um, uh, of, of Protestantism, unwittingly creates this materialistic, secular civilization that revolves around money and, and profit, um, and that is totally devoid of any kind of higher values. And this will be kind of like Weber's, you know, narrative that he tells about the modern world in general, is that the modern world becomes increasingly devoid of, of meaning. It loses any kind of spiritual or religious values that it once had. And it kind of becomes cold and calculating and based on cost benefit analysis and instrumental rationality. Um, it becomes what Weber famously calls an iron cage. So, um, having looked at Weber's key idea about the Protestant ethic, uh, we can turn now to looking at his uh, ideas about power and um, stratification uh, and his essay on what he calls class status and power. Like um, Karl Marx, Weber saw society uh, as one that is riddled with conflict and inequality and hierarchy. Um, and so he was willing to go, you know, kind of like where Durkheim was kind of not willing to go. Durkheim, you know, was either uh, blind to or, you know, did not want to recognize the way in which societies were divided by conflict, power and inequality and, and hierarchy. Uh, so Weber, in this sense, is, is kind of closer to Marx. Um, and uh, he sees that, you know, very much like economic stratification, 
uh, economic hierarchy, economic inequality is, is kind of at the root um, of these um, forms of uh, power in society. Weber famously defines power, and, and again, here is a definition that um, sociologists continue to employ, uh, or some sociologists continue to employ to this day, um, that you know the definition of power is the chance of a man or a number of men to realize their own will in a social action against the resistance of others who are participating in the action. In other words, you can basically like it's 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 the ability to 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 um, enforce your will over other people even when they resist. And uh, the you know throughout world history, Weber will say you know like their power has taken all kinds of different forms in um, political institutions and religion religion and. Uh, in culture, um, but under capitalist societies, it's economic forms of power that really become the dominant um, uh, source of power. And uh, under you know capitalism, of course, it's it's class that that uh, where economic forms of power sort of take root. He defines class in terms of this concept of life chances. Um, again, like this is a concept that sociologists use to this day that, you know, class kind of determines the amount of chances that we have for or opportunities that we have for success um, in society or failure in society, you know, so that like we um, are born into, you know, like, a, like in a game or, um, you know, something where like the richer you are, the more kind of like chances you have towards uh, success. And conversely, the poorer you are, the fewer the number of chances that you have um, for, you know, ascending the social hierarchy. So, um, Class is first and foremost de defined by a number of people who have in common a causal component of their life chances. And secondly, this component is represented exclusively by economic interests in the possession of goods and opportunity for income. So, you know, that this is kind of like how class manifests itself is in our material possessions, you know, our today would be like our home and our cars and our kind of technology that we got and you know the kind of uh, clothing that you know we have and you know all the sort of like the goods um that uh, define our lifestyle and um in terms of opportunities for income so you know people's salaries or their wages or what have you um, notice that this is different from how Marx defines class. Marx defines class as a relationship of ownership. Um, so for him, the main cleavage is between um, those who own the means of production and uh, which is, you know, a, a, a small but powerful uh, elite of uh, the capitalist class. And then on the other side, those who do not own the means of production and therefore have to work for a wage um, in order to buy the things that they need for their um, survival and reproduction. And that would be, you know, the mass numbers of people in society who are the workers, the proletariat, the 99%. Uh, so Marx and Weber kind of agree that capitalism is a, you know, a social system that create, you know, that really exacerbates hierarchies and inequalities, but they draw the, the you know, the source of that cleavage a little bit differently. Um, so... Weber, um, in making this distinction between 
uh, class and status as forms of power, um, argued that people do not are not simply motivated by um, a quest for uh, power simply in order to enrich themselves economically. Um, that they might be motivated for power according to its own sake. Um, here you can, you can envision that, that Weber is again engaged in a dialogue or a debate with Marxism, um, with the Marxism of his time. I, I would say he's, he's kind of um, engaged with a kind of like a crude form of Marxism, a kind of economic determinism um, that, that is really kind of a straw man that allows him to make his his own argument in um, in opposition to a kind of a caricatured version of Marxism. But he's basically saying that like, yeah, it's not just economics. Uh, it's not just money and wealth that motivates people towards power um, that, you know, yeah, people are motivated towards power, but um, it might be that they are motivated towards power for its own sake. And uh, here he throws in this concept of social honor, right? That, um, and this is kind of like a, uh, a value that's, it's like a residue or a, a hangover from the uh, aristocracy, the, the ruling class under feudalism that valued honor and the aristocracy also kind of distrusted money, you know, or people that had become powerful through money that was like, you know, associated with the merchant class and industrialists who, you know, might be wealthy, but they didn't have, they weren't held to the same, you know, kind of uh, put on the same kind of pedestal of social honor as the aristocracy was. So, He's basically, you know, drawing this distinction that I think he thinks that like Marxists are not, you know, have kind of conflated, you know, that they've conflated um, money and power or, or class and power. And, you know, Weber's trying to say like, they're not necessarily the same thing, that there is also what he calls like a status order um, in the way that status is distributed among different groups within a community. And so that people, in other words, might have money, but not necessarily status, right? That they might be wealthy, but they don't get invited to, you know, the fancy uh, balls or the, you know, like the, the fancy social gatherings that the aristocracy would attend. And, you know, conversely that there are some people that, um, you know, might have a kind of social honor, you know, like a, a priest or a, or a teacher, um, that, you know, are sort of honored by the community and have status within the community, but are not necessarily like rich or, or wealthy. So that these are like class and status are kind of related to one another, but not the same. Um, this would be an idea that, that's picked up um, more recently by sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu, um, who talked about the concept of like cultural capital and intellectual capital as something distinct from economic capital um, that kind of circulates and, and has like, it's almost like its own, um, its own economy uh, that is semi-independent from or semi-autonomous uh, from the strictly material world. So, um, Bourdieu and, and uh, he's had a whole kind of legion of, of followers that have, um, you know, followed in his footsteps and in, in doing uh, research along these lines, you know, about like cultural taste and, um, you know, symbolic forms of power as opposed to economic forms of power. So this status order and the social honor are not necessarily linked with their class situation. You know, another way of thinking about it is that, you know, that there's simply, there are things that can't just be bought. 
Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think like Weber is kind of recalling the fact that, you know, do you really have these, these different ruling classes, you know, that have different, you know, claims to power, you know, you have the old uh, aristocracy that you have, you know, in, in continental Europe that really um, ruled and legitimated itself by appealing to these values of honor and, and status. Um, and they, you know, were in, in large part opposed to these like newer forms of capitalist power, power that was you know, based in uh, money and, you know, material wealth and material acquisitions. And so these two, you know, kinds of ruling classes, um, especially in, 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 in Europe, um, although in the United States, like the, in, in the South, the Southern Aristotle, the, the Southern uh, ruling class really tried to imitate the uh, European aristocracy, but for the most part, this is a thing that, that kind of plays out in Europe around the, the transition from feudalism to capitalism is, is that there's like this competition between the old ruling class and the new ruling class. And sometimes you still hear people talk about this in terms of like the difference between old money and new money, right? That it's like not about like, it's not necessarily about the, the how much money the person has, but also the kind of like the, the honor or the status that goes with being old money um, as opposed to new money, which is often stereotyped as being, you know, kind of gaudier or tackier or, you know, just more um, flamboyant, more like showing it off. Um, so um, in continuing with the idea of status, you know, Weber says like these distinctions of status are, are um, enforced by uh, norms and, and laws, but also through religious sanction, um, that stratification by status takes its most extreme forms when the differences are thought to be, quote, ethnic in nature. Um, in other words, when there's a way that, you know, you have a social hierarchy that then is legitimated or justified in terms of there being like these cultural or religious or ethnic or, you know, especially in the United States, like perceived racial differences between people, that's when you get something that you know, Weber calls like a caste system. Um, a caste system is like when ethnically segregated groups do not uh, simply coexist in a horizontal system of cultural differences, but instead become part of a vertical system of domination and subordination. So in the, in the first you know, scenario, you, you can imagine a society in which you have cultural differences, but it's just like, people are like, you know, apples and oranges, like it's just different, but like, there's no like hierarchy. Um, when you have caste, it's when you have this kind of hierarchy, this vertical system of uh, when in which you have certain people at the top and certain people at the bottom, and they don't, you know, interact at all um, that and, and the, the bottom people are seen as, you know, kind of a pariah people or, you know, like untouchable people or, you know, people that, you know, the people at the top make a conscious effort to distance themselves from. And he's, you know, looks at all the ways you can find this around the world. You know, of course, the famous example being the, the caste system in India. Um, the ways in which uh, Jews have been, you know, sort of uh, subordinated within, um, you know, many parts of the of the world as a, you know, a kind of a pariah class or a pariah caste in this, in this case. Um, more recently, you know, the uh, American historian uh, Isabella Wilkerson has, has written a book called Caste about the United States um, 
uh, about like racism in America as a kind of caste system and sort of compares the history of American racism, especially American anti-Black racism uh, to other caste systems around the world. Um, her book has gotten a lot of attention for making those kinds of comparisons, you know, with like comparing the, the Jim Crow South or other manifestations of uh, the, you know, of, of American racism and segregation towards these other kinds of caste systems that you see uh, in different parts of the world at different times. So um, in terms of uh, this concept again of, of, of rationalization, this will kind of lead into um, Faber's analysis of power in, in modern society and especially the way power in modern society is institutionalized through bureaucracy. Um, Weber argued that modern society, uh, as we you know, kind of alluded to earlier, is characterized by this process of rationalization of the increasing dominance of a kind of instrumental rational way of thinking that is especially evident in economics and uh, in technology um, and that comes to dominate modern societies in terms of this like um, means end kind of thinking, this, this very calculated, cold, you know, cost benefit analysis to achieving the most, you know, efficient way of, of achieving a particular goal or objective that, you know, is, is kind of like taken for granted. Um, so it's, it's all about finding the, the, the most efficient means to an end. And he says like, you know, rationalization is this kind of ongoing process in which social interaction and institutions become, you know, increasingly governed by these, you know, this method, these, these, these methodical procedures and these, these rules of calculation. And the epitome of that in modern society, he says, is the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is, you know, like, almost the, the purest type of institutional organization, which embodies this kind of rationalization that is, that is run on these principles, uh, if you wanna call them principles of instrumental rationality. Um, a sociologist by the name of George Ritzer, um, you know, still writing and, and uh, with us today, um, has turned this theme into um, a whole series of books that he calls uh, the McDonaldization of society. So he kind of takes Weber's idea about rationalization and applies it to contemporary American society. And he says, basically, like, more and more society is becoming McDonaldized, like it's becoming basically run on the same principles that McDonald's is run on. And those are the principles, you know, first and foremost of efficiency, of you know calculation, of predictability, um, and of uh, control by non-human technology. So you know the the efficiency of fast food, and you know like the drive-through window, and you know getting you know you know kind of filling our, our meeting our needs for hunger in the fastest, cheapest but not necessarily good for you <laughs> kind of ways, right? So that's, you know, kind of the downside of rationalization is, is like, it's not really about like what's good for people or good for society. It's, it's more about like kind of what's the fastest, the cheapest, the easiest, you know, maybe the less risk, the least risky. Um, and, you know, oriented uh, uh, also towards calculation, towards quantifying, you know, so that like, you know, everything is kind of measured uh, down to the last, you know, second or the last ounce or, you know, that, that every moment of the, the McDonald's workers uh, work time is, you know, sort of structured and, and measured um, that every aspect of the food you know, is, is quantified and, and measured. So, you know, it, it's like, 
you know, it, it, it's like about the, you know, the quarter pounder or, you know, like, or it's quantified in the sense that like quantity becomes rules over quality so that like it's, it's, it's the Big Mac, it's not the Good Mac, you know, like it's like, it, it's like bigger is better and more is better. Um, and so quantity is, is elevated over, over quality in a McDonaldized society. And it becomes like, you know, super predictable in the sense of like, you can go to a McDonald's, you know, anywhere in America, anywhere around the world. And like the chicken McNuggets will always taste the same, you know, like it's no, there's no like local differences. There's no like, you know, uh there, there's nothing like there's no unknown you know there's no it's a completely like kind of predictable environment and then you know controlled by non-human technologies as far as like more and more the the work that the the labor that was done by human beings is more and more kind of shifted towards uh machinery uh computers um, you know, the technology that has basically replaced human labor. Um, and here again is where Marx and Weber are very much on the same page. Um, Marx believed this was a, an inherent dynamic of capitalism was uh, for capitalists to increasingly invest in productive machinery that was intended to replace the labor that was formerly done by human beings. And we see this throughout the history of capitalism, the ways in which machinery has replaced human labor. So this whole process, as I invoked earlier, creates what Weber very pessimistically calls an iron cage um, from which the individual uh, has little power um, to escape. Um, and in which people are increasingly devoid of meaning because the things that used, they used to find meaning in, like uh, religion or spirituality or, um, you know, in, uh, in tradition, uh, the ways, the, the, the things that people formerly found meaning in have sort of been carved up and thrown away by the modern world. And we are left in this iron cage of, you know, capitalism, money, science, technology, you know, this, this very kind of cold calculating um, and, and spiritually bankrupt world, uh, Weber says. Um, you can maybe begin to understand why he had a, uh, a, a breakdown in his life. Um, when we look at bureaucracy, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the, the, the epitome, the embodiment of these principles of rationalization. Any kind of bureaucracy is, um, uh, is, is, is founded on these, these kinds of ideas of you know, efficiency, calculation, predictability, control by non-human technologies. And again, this is something that Weber is, is, is fundamentally ambivalent about. It's, it's important to know he's not entirely opposed uh, to the formations of bureaucracies. He's also not like celebratory of bureaucracies. Um, he recognizes what's useful about them and why the modern world kind of can't do without them. And at the same time, he's very aware of their drawbacks and the way that they dehumanize people, they turn people into uh, objects and, and numbers and things, um, and therefore are like literally dehumanizing of people uh, in the way that they, you know, process and, and treat human beings. So bureaucracies are crucial for, you know, societies in which you have millions of people and and you you know if you want to do anything in a in a kind of an efficient or vaguely democratic kind of way um they are necessary um but although they may be crucial for mass democracy he says they nevertheless create this kind of rarefied 
um, group of uh, you know elite experts and technocrats, uh, particularly like within government or within the military or within universities, um, certainly within uh, the corporate world. And so these, um, these experts become, you know, more and more kind of uh, an, um, an unaccountable or, you know, um, a, 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 you know, just, just sort of a, a rarefied group. So Weber contended, you know, that as much as these bureaucracies are necessary for modern society, that they also, you know, result in a loss of individual freedom. They trap us all in this kind of, you know, iron cage of uh, rules and procedures. And it's all very kind of like faceless and, and anonymous and, and inhuman, you know, in which, you know, we try, we call on the phone and try to talk to somebody and it's like you know press this number press this number you never actually get to speak to a human being um or you know even when you do get to speak to a human being it's like the human being is just kind of in service of these these larger rules or procedures that they don't have any control over um and so it's this very kind of objectifying system um, in which, you know, people come to be like processed and administered, you know, as if they were things, as if they were objects on an assembly line, you know, who are just kind of being passed through. And so it, in that sense, you know, it is fundamentally thoroughly dehumanizing as an institution. And so, you know, we all have these kinds of experiences. I mean, certainly the university is, is, a, is an example of a bureaucracy. I could probably go on for another hour about that. Um, or, you know, like the Department of Motor Vehicles or, you know, like any number of, um, of these kind of institutions and organizations. And, and again, the, you know, they're not necessarily... Um, motivated by profit. I mean, you know, corporations are certainly um, profit oriented uh, bureaucracies, but there are plenty of sort of like nonprofit oriented bureaucracies, Weber is saying that that also have these kind of built in problems. And, and this is like one dis difference between Marx and Weber here in the sense that like Weber was kind of pessimistic about socialism because he believed that even if you got rid of the profit motive, you would still have these, you, you would still have a society dominated by these kind of faceless dehumanizing bureaucracies, you know, that the, and that, you know, these, the experts within the state and, and, uh, within governments would kind of, you know, take power on their own, even though they weren't, even if they weren't like benefiting, you know, monetarily, economically, they would still be interested in power for its own state, its own sake. And, you know, this is, this kind of dovetails a lot with like, you know, where the Soviet Union went wrong and, and where other experiments in uh, socialist societies, you know, were limited by these kind of state bureaucracies that turned into these just kind of, you know, unaccountable juggernauts of bureaucratic power. So here, in a sense, like Weber's um, more pessimistic uh, analysis of modern society, where, you know, Weber doesn't really believe you know, as Marx did, that there is like um, a more liberatory, uh, you know, a more liberating or more utopian possibility that can emerge out of capitalism. He kind of believes, again, that we're just like trapped in this iron cage. So the key features of, you know, bureaucracies have to do with, you know, like 
a, a hierarchical structure, uh, like a chain of command. So, you know, it, everything, you know, being kind of modeled after like the military, you know, kind of a military mode. Um, and in one in which uh, like the, the selection of personnel is supposed to be based on, uh, on merit. Now here again is, is where Weber is constructing an ideal type of a bureaucracy. Um, one in which like the, the actual real bureaucracies might not necessarily feature all of these characteristics, especially the second one. Um, so the ideal bureaucracy is one in which people move up and down the ladder based on the merit of their work and their jobs, um, as opposed to other institutions, you know, in the past that were based on like, you know, somebody is somebody's cousin or somebody's family member, or, you know, based on like sort of tradition or, you know, some kind of bribery or, you know, all the different ways in which like organizations, especially political organizations um, have operated um, and continue to operate. Weber says like, you know, in a pure bureaucracy, that, that wouldn't be the case. In a pure ideal type of the bureaucracy, everything would be based on merit. But of course, like that's not the way, you know, usually um, like things necessarily necessarily work. Um, you know, it's often is about uh, nepotism, you know, about family connections or, or um, about tradition, um, but it's at least supposed to be about uh, merit. And um, within these bureaucracies, you have this kind of division of labor um, that's supposed to make things more efficient for assigned tasks. So you know, here you have like a, a certain parallel with Durkheim in terms of their interest in the division of labor and uh, the recognition that the division of labor is kind of indispensable for modern societies insofar as they make things more efficient and they, they allow people to be more productive by sort of specializing and becoming experts in a particular task. And that that kind of multiplies the productivity in a given workplace or or an office or, you know, a government bureaucracy is if we have a divided labor force in which people can kind of focus on one particular task as opposed to dividing their time between doing a number of different tasks. It makes for super boring work, but it makes for really productive workers. Um, and uh, finally, you know, that these bureaucracies are supposed to be governed by formal, impersonal rules that regulate all facets of the organization. You know, that word impersonal is, is, is very important here in the sense of like, there are supposed to be these objective rules uh, that no one is above, no matter, you know, who's you know, who their father is or, you know, like, uh, you know, no matter like how much um, power they may have, the ideal of the bureaucracy, at least, again, not necessarily the reality, but the ideal type of the bureaucracy is one in which like there are these impersonal rules that everybody is subjected to, no matter who they are. Uh, finally, we get to, um, you know, from one ideal type to another, as far as like forms of power, Weber talks about different kinds of authority or what he calls legitimate domination. Um, and these, the three kinds of ideal, uh, the, you know, the three ideal types of authority that he carves out are um, rational or legal authority, uh, traditional authority and charismatic authority. And again, these are abstract concepts um, that do not necessarily correspond to reality um, or that are kind of like more better understood as kind of mixed up and messier uh, in reality. So none of them exists exactly in, in pure form. Um, when Weber talks about the concept of authority here, he means um, not just the power that certain 
uh, individuals or groups of individuals have over others, but also the way in which their power is seen as legitimate, um, is the way that their power is respected. And so therefore the people who are subjected to its power um, kind of willingly consent to their authority. They, you know, they aren't just coerced. They aren't simply forced at the point of a gun or, you know, the threat of prison or something like that. It's that they all people, um, people have legitimate authority to the extent that people who are underneath them, who are below them, willingly follow along with their authority and do what they say out of a position of consent and not just out of um, coercion. So rational and legal authority is kind of, you know, like what, you know, you see like in the, in the legal system and in, you know, it, Weber's point is that rational and legal authority becomes like the dominant form of authority in modern society. Um, that this increasingly authority becomes based on these uh, rules of bureaucracy, of uh, political power, uh, certainly of uh, economic power, you know, that they appeal to principles of uh, rationality and the law in order to justify and legitimate their power. Traditional authority, you know, kind of like it just, just kind of like it sounds, um, would have to do with, you know, people having authority that is recognized by others based on the fact that they inhabit a certain kind of tradition. You know, it's based basically on the idea that like tradition says that we recognize that these people, and that's kind of like how it's always been done, how, you know, previous generations did it. And so there's kind of an unquestioned, unthinking attachment to, you know, these forms of tradition. Weber says that that kind of authority is more likely to be found in like pre-modern or, you know, pre-capitalist kinds of society uh, in which tradition was venerated. Um, and I think he's thinking here, especially of the aristocracy uh, as the ruling class under feudalism that ruled by appealing to these values of honor and loyalty, um, you know, based, so things based in tradition. And then finally you have like charismatic authority, which is kind of based on the, um, you know, the, this, as it sounds, you know, like charisma, the kind of special qualities of the leader. Um, and that is usually something to be found more in a kind of like a religious kind of scenario, um, but also to some extent, and in, in politics, I think as well, where the charisma of the leader, you know, is the thing that people respect and revere and, and the reason that they follow along is because they believe that the leader has some kind of, you know, it, it might be supernatural powers, you know, might, you know, they might believe it has some kind of mystical kind of powers or you know they might just think that they're a really you know special kind of individual. Um, the most extreme kinds of charismatic authority are probably to be found in cults. Uh, you know where it's like the 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 leader kind of seems to radiate some kind of special power uh, that people sort of revere and worship and, and, and look up to. So again, like, you know, you, you find this kind of mixture in, in reality of, of different forms. Um, and it's important to note that these are kind of like pu pure types, uh, ideal types. And, um, you know, in, in looking at traditional authority and charismatic authority, Weber says they, those kind of like, they kind of fade away in modern society or they become less important over time, but they don't go away all, all together entirely, especially this thing, you know, he calls charismatic authority. Um, because as, as we've 
kind of emphasized Weber is fundamentally ambivalent about this whole process of rationalization, you know, this whole process in which modern society has become increasingly dominated by science and technology. You know, he believes that this uh, may make for a more productive society, but it's one that is increasingly bereft of meaning um, or any kind of, you know, spiritual value. And he, you know, he's very much, um, you know, one thing I, I haven't mentioned to this point is the influence of, of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche on Weber. Um, Nietzsche had a similarly ambivalent or I, I would say more negative perspective on the development of modern society um, that, you know, is, is, is expressed in his what was very controversial at the time for him to have said this idea that god is dead um which is kind of a, amounts to the same thing that weber is saying when he's when he talks about an iron cage of modernity um it's just basically that like this this spiritual religious you know kind of uh beliefs in 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 magic and and uh in you know things that you know, couldn't be explained by science and rationality, um, that those things have kind of been erased by modern society and that we're left in this kind of spiritually meaningless existence. Um, and yet human beings kind of need something meaningful and uh, continue to engage in this search for meaning. And so Weber says, you know, like, people in this, in this modern cage of society, they, you know, they, they still need to find meaning and yet they find themselves in this society where everything is kind of reduced to like these, you know, pretty meaningless things like, you know, money and, um, you know, science and technology and bureaucracy. And, you know, people have a hard time finding meaning in the modern world. Um, and he's, you know, he believes that this is something that is, you know, part of the, the essence of the human condition, but that we have, you know, fewer and fewer sources. Um, people for most of human history have found meaning in, you know, religion and tradition and, and those sorts of things. Um, and the modern world, you know, kind of erases that. So in this increasingly meaningless modern world, it kind of creates this like attraction towards new kinds of charismatic leaders um, who, you know, kind of promise to their followers, you know, some kind of purpose and, and direction in their lives that, you know, can't be offered simply by the sort of material, um, rational, parts of modern society they appeal in other words the charismatic leader appeals to some kind of um uh desire for uh, you know charisma and meaning that uh are you know that have been that have been erased by modern society and in this sense he he kind of like foresaw you know, uh, the rise of charismatic fascist leaders like, like Hitler um, being the most extreme example, you know, it, there, there's, a, there's a certain parallel with, with what Nietzsche talked about as, you know, the, the rise of the Ubermensch or the, the Superman as a, as a kind of figure that could promise to do for people what modern society cannot which is to find some higher purpose, some to appeal to some kind of spiritual longing that uh, has been neglected um, by capitalism, science, technology, bureaucracy, and all the rest of it. And so these, this kind of charismatic authority is one that he spends a little bit more time you know kind of like probing into because he believes that it's an important source of social change um again like that uh 
in, in forms of charismatic authority, the uh, demand for obedience is legitimated by appealing to something special about the leader, that they have this gift of grace, which is, you know, demonstrated through extraordinary uh, acts, uh, acts of heroism, acts of, you know, um, or, you know, like miracles, you know, revelations. Um, and so it, it appeals to this part of us that, you know, wants to believe in some, something greater, something higher, something greater than ourselves, and increasingly can't find that greater thing, because we are sort of trapped in this iron cage of mundane, um, profane, you know, existence of, of, of money and, and uh, technology. And so like traditional authority, uh, you know, lo loyalty in this case is, is owed to the person um, and not to uh, an office or a bureaucratic position that they hold. And again, you know, like if we think about these things in ideal types, as ideal types, which, you know, maybe mix, you know, uh, different forms of authority together, then it does help us to see that like, you know, there are th th this charismatic authority. It might not have the importance that it did, you know, um, in uh, previous historical eras, but it's still with us. Um, that there are still like people that have power by virtue of some perceived charisma or special characteristics that they have. Um, and that can go in a kind of a positive direction of like, you know, or, you know, like a socially progressive direction. Um, and it could also go like in a socially negative, you know, like cults um, or, you know, like the, <laughs> uh, like quite frankly around, you know, somebody like Donald Trump, like where the, there is just a kind of a, putting the, the leader on this kind of uh, untouchable pedestal. Um, so it's important not to make any value judgments about the charismatic authority itself. Um, I think Weber believes it, could, it can be used for good or for ill, um, but that uh, it continues to be, even though it's, it's kind of a residual force, um, it continues to be one that is still um, with us in the modern world and in some ways that people look to in the modern world precisely because the modern world is so bereft of uh, larger spiritual meaning and purpose. Okay, so I think that that kind of um, summarizes hopefully or gives you a good overview to Weber's uh, work and his writings. I hope that this will be useful for you. And uh, I think that's about all we got. Okay. Thank you very much.